welcome everyone and good afternoon. My name is Joseph Kearney and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you to our annual Nice Lecture in Intellectual Property. We are very delighted that all of you are here. Let me begin by recalling the person in whose memory this lecture stands. The law school created this annual lecture series in 1998 to honor the late Helen Wilson Neese, who had served as a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. This was at the suggestion of one of our faculty who secured the enthusiastic assent of Judge Neese's family. Judge Neese is widely remembered still today within the intellectual property bar as a very generous individual and a hardworking, serious, and modest judge. It has been a great privilege for us to make this lecture a constant of our intellectual property program, even as under the leadership of professors Bruce Boyden and Kaylee Murray, we have expanded that program in recent years. <laughs> Today's lecture, like Judge Neese, has spent much of his professional career in Washington, D.C. After graduating from Harvard College and the University of Chicago Law School, Ted Elliott clerked in that area, first across the Potomac for Judge Michael Ludig of the Fourth Circuit, and then for Justice Antonin Scalia at the United States Supreme Court. His subsequent work took him at various points to Kirkland and Ellis in D.C., where he became a partner to the Department of Justice as Chief of Staff to the Attorney General, and to the White House in the White House Counsel's Office, and then as Deputy Staff Secretary to the President of the United States. Yet it is his work in the private sector that especially commends Mr. Elliott to us for our Nice Lecture. In particular, in 2008, he returned to the Bay Area, from which he originally hailed, to become the General Counsel for a company known as Facebook. In that role, he helped lead the company until 2013. This was, of course, the period in which Facebook grew from a small private enterprise to the publicly traded giant it remains today. Along the way, the company found itself embroiled in a number of high-profile intellectual property disputes. Mr. Olia guided Facebook through all of these an and an extraordinary number of other legal matters. Mr. Elliott has continued his interest in legal and policy matters in the years since. He heads an innovative policy and regulatory affairs group at the leading Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Andreessen Horowitz, where he is a partner. He is an extraordinary lawyer in tactics, learning, and even wisdom, and I would gladly detail that further. But the idea is to hear not so much about him as from him. So please join me in welcoming to Marquette Law School for this year's Nice Lecture, Ted Elliott. Thank you, Joe, or as I call him, Dean Joe. Um, and, and I also should say, in, at the risk of, of offending other judges whom I do not recognize in the room. I see that Judge Kavanaugh came in, and that substantially increases the pressure. So Judge Kavanaugh, great to see you here. Um, <clears throat> delighted to be here today. Joe, I appreciate the introduction. I'm delighted to be here and honored to be here today at Marquette University Law School to deliver the Nice Lecture in Intellectual Property. Um, having said that, it actually was with some trepidation that I boarded the plane yesterday to fly into Milwaukee. That's because, full disclosure, I'm a lifelong fan, and therefore, yes, a long-suffering fan of the hated Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> We're season ticket holders of the Vikings in my family. I take my kids to Vikings training camp in Mankato, Minnesota most summers. And in the playoffs this past January, we traveled from California out to Minnesota to freeze outside in minus six degree weather, watching the Vikes battle fiercely against the Seahawks only to shank a last-minute chip-shot field goal to lose the game, <laughs> snatching defeat from the jaws of victory in classic Vikings fashion. <clears throat> Here in Wisconsin, you all probably cheered and laughed at that moment, at that latest Vikings meltdown. And I will confess, I tend to cheer when I see Green Bay on the short end of the scoreboard. Uh, but, so in short, while I live in California, I'm a big Vikings fan. I bleed purple, as they say. 
So of course my fear, would I be safe coming to the Badger State, surrounded by cheese heads, especially after the Vikings unseated the Packers last year's NFC North champions. I mean, feelings might be raw. But after worrying about this for an undue amount of time, I realized that in fact everything would be okay. Why? Because after all, your very own law school dean, Joe Kearney, is himself a lifelong Vikings fan. It's true, look it up. Actually, if you do try to look it up, and I did, just to fact check this, but if you do try to look it up, I know, the, I know it's correct, but if you do try to look it up on the web, you'll find that while Joe is quite open about his allegiance to the Chicago White Sox, which by the way, it's easy to be now that the Brewers are playing in the National League, easy to be, to be celebrating your White Hawks fandom up here, he's hidden his Vikings allegiance quite well, until now that is, his dark secret has been revealed. <laughs> so Joe, I'm very sorry to out you in this crowd. But it's pretty clear that after, 20, after almost 20 years at Marquette, including superb leadership as dean since 2003, you've built up more than enough credibility and goodwill here to survive the otherwise highly damaging, even career-limiting <laughs> revelation that you're a Vikings fan. Um, but staying on the subject of Joe Kearney, <laughs> I know he likes us to say, on, in all seriousness, I couldn't be prouder of Joe or more impressed with him for the great record he's built here at the law school. Starting with beautiful uh, uh, beautiful Eckstein Hall that we're in today. Uh, you know, I, Joe took me on a great lengthy tour of this yesterday. It's a fantastic building. I was searching for the words, uh, searching for the words to really capture the essence of this place. And I was thinking noble, bold, harmonious, <laughs> he gets this, dramatic, confident, slightly willful, and in a word, great. Those are the words that Joe used at the dedication of, of, the, of this building back in 2010. Um, and I do agree, in all seriousness, it's a spectacular building. What a great setting for the law school. Everything's really thought out. Joe clearly put a lot of thought into this. And you know, I would love to go to law school here. It's a beautiful spot. Um, other achievements here that I think about, Joe, are helping launch the Marquette University Law School poll, which in less than five years' time has garnered enormous respect and influence nationwide, including playing such a leading year already in this year's presidential campaign. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, Joe's proudest achievement as dean, which is convening the 2012 symposium, marking the 125th anniversary of the Interstate Commerce Act. <laughs> I know that that is Joe's, and that was a gift to insomniacs everywhere. <laughs> um, so there's a lot to celebrate with Joe here. Joe and I met when we spent an unforgettable and truly life-defining year together as law clerks to Justice Antonin Scalia. The year was 1995 to 96, the Justice's 10th year on the court. It's 20 years ago, it's exactly 20 years ago that we were in the middle of the clerkship. The memories are still fresh, of course. The impact that Justice Scalia had on us and our co-clerks as lawyer and as people cannot be overstated. Joe has, himself has written quite eloquently about this in a wonderful tribute that he published, or that the Journal Sentinel published in February. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I strongly commend it to you, I urge you to read it. It captures perfectly the spirit of the justice, his unparalleled impact on the court and on the law, his superb sense of humor, including some stories at Joe's expense, and his enduring influence on his law clerks. In February, Joe and I made a sad journey back to Washington to say farewell to the justice. Among other things, Joe and I took a shift standing vigil together, just the two of us, with Justice Scalia one final time as his body lay in repose in the great hall of the court. It was a powerful, deeply moving experience for me to be there with Joe, paying tribute to the justice who taught us so much and who helped define who we are, not just as lawyers, but also as people. There was no one more fitting with whom to be there than Joe. Uh, the title of my remarks today, moving now to the intellectual property part of this, the title of my remarks today is Innovation, Disruption, and Intellectual Property, A View from Silicon Valley. As a lawyer who has spent the last few years advising companies in Silicon Valley, and who has learned a lot and been surprised by a lot over that time, I thought it might be interesting for this audience of IP law experts to hear a first-hand perspective on how intellectual property is viewed and is being disrupted, as the popular Silicon Valley saying goes, out there in the valley. The American technology sector centered in and around Silicon Valley stands today as a celebrated leader of innovation, disruption, and economic progress. 
there's plenty to mock. I'll emphasize this throughout. There's plenty to mock and make fun of about Silicon Valley. You know, one of the nice things is we don't, I think we don't take ourselves altogether too seriously. So there's a lot to mock about it. But for better or for worse, it is celebrated as this in innovative institution. You know, you think of companies like Apple and Google, the number one and number two companies in the world by market cap. Facebook, which recently passed Walmart to become the number 12 company by market cap in the world, barely three years into life as a public company. Innovative startups like Tesla, Twitter, Pinterest, Airbnb, Uber, and Lyft. The list goes on, of course. And that's not to mention the long list of older, more established technology companies out in the valley, Hewlett Packard, Intel, eBay, PayPal, and so on. Numerous factors have been cited as contributing to the Valley's success as a hub of innovation. Among those frequently mentioned are strong universities, Stanford and Berkeley, Santa Clara, among others. Access to ample venture capital from funds like Andreessen Horowitz, uh, investors with, with great tolerance for risk, let's say, which is, for an entrepreneur, a nice thing to have. Uh, people who are willing to lose money in order to make money on, on one out of 10 or two out of, or one out of five bets. Another factor people point to, free movement of labor and talent. That's because non-compete agreements are not enforceable in California. That's very nice. Em uh, workers can go from company to company, and there's no worry about being accused of stealing secrets and so on. And then finally, maybe even California weather and Napa Valley wines is a contributor to why, you know, why California and not, and not Phoenix. Um, as lawyers, though, we all, we all can be proud of the role the rule of law has played in the innovation culture in Silicon Valley. And that's, don't just take it from a lawyer like me or like us in this room, uh, the, the founder of our firm, and Mark Andreessen, who's a computer scientist, has nothing to do with the law. When he talks about the success of Silicon Valley, he puts rule of law as the third, the third most important thing for him. Um, so rule of law is important, and perhaps no aspect of law more than in, in American intellectual property law, whose fundamental purpose, after all, is to promote innovation. For this expert audience, it's probably not necessary to demonstrate the linkage between IP law and innovation, but just in case, let's do a little bit of it. Starting with the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, uh, Clause 8, Congress has assigned the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So right from the outset, in the Constitution, the stated purpose of patent and copyright law is to promote scientific and artistic process, pr progress, i.e. innovation. So you see it right there. On trademark, the innovation link is less discussed and not as direct. Usually when we think of trademark, we think about consumer protection, building goodwill in your brand, and so on. <clears throat> but I think, I, I think there's a strong innovation link there. As the, court, as the Supreme Court itself said, this is the Qualitex case, the year before Joe and I were clerks at the court, the court said, trademark law helps assure a producer that it and not an imitating competitor will reap the financial reputation related rewards associated with a desirable product. So invest in the desirable product and in innovate there and then you will reap the rewards and trademark, not just patent and copyright, will help you do so. So surely IP law, the clear purpose of which is to incentivize innovation, has played a critical and well appreciated role in tech innovation in Silicon Valley. True, but, and this is the thrust of my remarks today, the relationship between intellectual property law and today's Silicon Valley innovators and technologists is, as the kids say, complicated. Um, so that's what I want to focus on. Specifically, it's complicated in two ways. First, the prevailing view in Silicon Valley today among software engineers is that IP law is prone to being abused. And of course, that's a feature of any legal structure, any legal regime, laws everywhere can be abused. But the interesting thing, when it comes to intellectual property law, the perception is that the abuse is not just abuse you know, for a bunch of varied purposes, you know, tax cheating, et cetera. It's not that, but specifically the abuse ends up hindering innovation. So whereas patent, copyright, and trademark laws are designed to promote innovation, they're being misused, there's the perception, in a way and to an extent that discourages and defeats innovation. I'll give some examples of this in each of the three realms, patent, copyright, and trademark. But suffice to say, the widespread perception among Silicon Valley technologists, right or wrong, but it's the widespread perception, is that IP laws are often more of an impediment to progress and innovation than an enabler thereof. Second point, 
it's not just that IP laws are prone to abuse that ends up defeating the purpose of those laws. In addition, there's an emerging view, particularly among software engineers in the Valley, that the fundamental underpinning of American intellectual property law, namely, as I see it, the free market concept that innovation is best achieved by giving inventors incentive to innovate and exploit, and by the incentive of an exclusive right to exploit and profit from their inventions. That, in the view of Silicon Valley these days, is misplaced or no longer operative. Instead, the increasingly popular view, certainly with respect to software and also increasingly with respect to hardware, is that technological advances are more likely to come through sharing and collaboration rather than via the exclusive rights paradigm of traditional intellectual property law. Perhaps the best example of this is the rapid growth in popularity of the open source movement in which software designs and occasionally hardware too are shared openly and often for free. There's not a license, they can be licenses, but they're free licenses. So those, that's an overview of the two key points I want to make today. Um, and I'll illustrate those points, I'll try to illustrate them with some case studies and war stories from my time working as a lawyer and advisor in Silicon Valley. Before diving into those though, a couple of final caveats. One, my comments regarding IP laws, they are focused primarily on the software sector which is where I've spent most of my career at Facebook, now at Andreessen Horowitz, where most of the companies we invest in are software-based companies. And even back in my early days when, as a young lawyer at what was then AOL Time Warner as an in-house lawyer there. So software is where I'm focused. Um, if, in areas outside the software sector, hardware, but especially biotech, you'll find a lot more, a lot more sympathy and a lot more support for patents and traditional IP rules. But the point I would make is as software becomes integrated into more and more products and more and more facets of our lives, as Mark Andreessen from our firm says, he has this phrase, he says, software is eating the world, meaning software is getting involved in more and more things, your cars, drones, financial products, uh, bio products, you know, Fitbits, and so on. Uh, as software is eating the world, the perspective of the software community regarding intellectual property is likely to become increasingly influential. So even if it's a niche view now, I think I predict it becomes a more widespread view. Second caveat, I'm humbled to be up here giving the Nice lecture because I don't consider myself in any sense an expert in intellectual property law. Um, Joe told me the other day, he said, you're lucky that I didn't show you the list of prior speakers for this lecture. <laughs> So yeah, that's right. I did take a peek at it and saw Judge Posner on there and others, great IP law experts. I'm not an, an expert in intellectual property law. Um, I didn't even take an IP law class in law school. Sorry, Bruce. Um, uh, um, and and at, when I was with Judge Kavanaugh and others at Kirkland, our practice had very little to do with, with IP law. It was mostly litigation, administrative law, some antitrust, some corporate governance, and so on. Um, so be, just to be clear, in the case of conflict between anything I tell you today, anything that Professors Boyd and Murray are teaching you, go with what they say, please, for your sake. Um, but, but while I'm no sense an expert on patent or IP law, I don't consider myself one, I spend a lot of time dealing with it in the past few years. So what I do hope to offer is a perspective of a practitioner out there in Silicon Valley who spent several years dealing with IP law as is being practiced today in the wild. Um, in an innovative and rapidly evolving sector where legal doctrines and prevailing theories can change dramatically in years, if not months. So to the first point now, the widespread perception that patent law, copyright, and trademark law are too often abused in, in a way that, that hinders innovation. Let's start with patents. 20 years ago, and maybe even as recently as five to 10 years ago, if you had walked into the office of a successful programmer in Silicon Valley, you most likely would have seen proudly displayed on her office wall framed patent certificates from the US PTO, the Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, these have the nice gold seal, the red ribbon you know, frame, nicely done, um, attesting to all the patents that the programmer had secured. Today, that picture is very different. To begin with, in today's Silicon Valley, there are no offices. Um, the Valley has embraced the open desk environment, first popularized by Facebook, where not even Mark Zuckerberg, seriously, not even Mark Zuckerberg has an office. Um, there are not even cubicles in most Silicon Valley companies today. Instead, there are desks. Employees are working out in the open at just very simple desks, probably, probably this wide, 
no phone on the desk, simply a laptop, maybe a big screen if you want one. Nothing there, no, of course no drawers because it's a paperless office, what would you need drawers for? So there's no offices, so there'd be nowhere to hang patent certificates from the PTO. So that's one reason you don't see them. But the other reason is because most software engineers in Silicon Valley today would not be caught dead with a patent certificate on their wall. Um, and this is, this is um, because patents are viewed, and this is a, a new change, patents have become viewed with some disdain by software programmers out there. The attitude of the modern software engineer is captured well in a post that I'll read from, from Mozilla Corporation. Mozilla produced the Firefox browser and also is a free software community. This is from Mozilla's general counsel who writes about the problem of the PTO having granted in the early 2000s, late 90s and early 2000s, uh, software patents and business method patents that are too broad. And so this is the view in Silicon Valley today. The threat posed by the growing, this is the GC of, of Mozilla, the threat posed by the growing pervasiveness of overbroad and vague software patents is the shroud of fear, uncertainty, and doubt they cast over emerging and innovative technologies. It can feel impossible to know whether you're infringing somebody else's software patent, which can slow or frustrate innovation. It is sadly ironic that much of the increasing cost of software patent issues are borne by innovators themselves, the very individuals the patent system was supposed to incentivize. Congress has gotten into the act with various patent law reform efforts lately. In 2011, Congress passed by heavy bipartisan majorities and the president signed into law the America Invents Act with the stated purpose of improving patent quality and, quote, weeding out patents that never should have been issued in the first place. That law, the American Invents Act, represented the first major overhaul of the patent system in about 60 years. But calls for patent reform have continued. So for the past couple of years, Congress has been considering another patent reform bill, H.R. 9, coming out of the House, obviously, titled the Innovation Act. And here's the House Judiciary Chairman Bob Goodlatte talking about that. Remember, this is very close after America Invents came out. Congress is still working on it. So even after America Invents came out and in in went into effect in 2012, the Innovation Act, and Goodlatt, Goodlatt says this about it, he says, abusive patent litigation is a drag on our economy. The Bipartisan Innovation Act is designed to eliminate the abuses of our patent system, discourage frivolous patent litigation, and keep U.S. patent laws up to date. These important actions will help fuel the engine of American innovation and creativity, creating new jobs and growing our economy. So that, that law, H.R. 9, is not yet passed, but it's telling that, that so soon after 2012 with the AIA, the perception of many in Congress, including the chairman of House Judiciary, is that patent laws are still being abused in a way that hampers innovation and that change is needed. Certainly that's the prevailing view in Silicon Valley among engineers. And in my time, there was perhaps no better illustration of this than when Yahoo sued us, Facebook, for alleged patent infringement in early 2012 and how that played out. So I'll turn to that as a case study. So this is February 2012. Facebook's long-awaited in initial public offering, IPO, was imminent. We had just filed our Form S1 with the SEC, which signals your intent to go public within a reasonably short time period. And we ended up going public in May of that year, actually trading. Um, but before we got to May, in late February, about three weeks after we filed our S1, um, Yahoo made its move. So out of the blue one day, I got an email from the general counsel of Yahoo, who I considered and still consider a friend. This is all professional. Um, and he said, hey, you're, you're, can we, are you free for a phone call? I said, sure, anytime, of course. Of course, Mike, anytime, let's do a phone call. And I said, email, what's the purpose? I want to be prepared. What's the purpose of it? And he said, you know, I, let's wait till the call. It's probably better explained over the phone. So we had a pretty good sense of what was going on at that point. So then a couple days later, we actually do the call Monday in late February of 2012. And after some pleasantries and some hemming and hawing, his, my secretary had been his former secretary, so there was some exchange like that. He said, hey, uh, Ted, by the way, we've been looking closely at Facebook's products and services, and we've come to the conclusion that Facebook infringes many of Yahoo's patents. We'd be happy to meet, he says. We'd be happy to meet and discuss the specifics of how you guys infringe our patents. And what an acceptable payment would be for your company to take a license from Yahoo. <laughs> So that was my reaction, your reaction is my reaction. So it was exactly what we expected. So I did laugh and I said, Mike, okay, so Mike, this is how it works. This is the pre-IPO patent shakedown. I get it, I get what's going on. So he denied any such thing, but 20, literally 20 minutes 
After our call ended, we got a call from the New York Times asking us for comment on a report from unspecified people briefed on the matter that Yahoo was threatening a patent lawsuit against Facebook. So the squeeze was on. Uh, as the Times website reported that afternoon, the two companies reportedly spoke on Monday to discuss the issue, with Yahoo contending that Facebook is infringing on 10 to 20 patents, according to these people who are not authorized to discuss the issue publicly. Wonder where they got that story. Um, Yahoo is asking Facebook to pay licensing fees or risk facing a lawsuit. And as the Times put it correctly, Yahoo's saber rattling happens to come at a delicate time for Facebook which is preparing to go public this spring in one of the most anticipated market debuts in years. The Times Muse, it is unclear how much money Yahoo could wrangle out of any potential agreement with Facebook, but the Times suggested it could run into the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not, if not, uh, if not 10 figures. So the pre-IPO patent shakedown by Yahoo was indeed on. Then this was not Yahoo's first rodeo. Eight years earlier in 2004, Yahoo had done the same thing to Google, pursuing a patent lawsuit against the search giant on the eve of Google's IPO. Google ended up settling the lawsuit in August 04, just two weeks before going public, giving Yahoo 2.7 million, million shares, not dollars worth, 2.7 million shares of Google stock, worth at the time around 300 million bucks, and potentially much more along the way, depending on when they sold it. Uh, some estimates are that Yahoo made over a billion dollars on that, on that settlement with the stock. This prior history is why we saw this Yahoo pre-IPO shakedown coming. It had worked in 2004 against Google, so in 2012, Yahoo figured why not go, again go after the latest high-profile internet company on the eve of its IPO at its moment of greatest vulnerability to coerce a hefty settlement payment. It's not unreasonable. It seems like a pretty good theory if, if I'm over there at Yahoo. But, and this is interesting. What Yahoo had utterly failed to comprehend is, the, is that the patent landscape had absolutely changed in the intervening eight years since its lawsuit against Google during Google's IPO. So between 2004 and 2012, things are very different. Specifically, Yahoo failed to appreciate just how wildly unpopular in the valley this lawsuit would be. Yahoo instantly became a pariah. Um, in its complaint, Yahoo claimed that the core, fe the core features of Facebook were in fact invented by Yahoo. Quoting from the complaint, for much of the technology upon which Facebook is based, Yahoo got there first and was therefore granted patents by the PTO to protect those innovations. Quote, Facebook's entire social network model, unquote, is based on patented Yahoo technology. In another era, such as eight years earlier in the, in the Google litigation, those claims, I think, might have garnered some respect among engineers and inspired fear at Facebook, but not so in 2012. Patents had become a bad word in the software developer community and highly disfavored. So the Silicon Valley community erupted with anger at Yahoo, with no, no prompting by us. We didn't do anything to provoke this. This is just coming in. So first, a few examples of this. These are fun and colorful, I think. Um, first, David Sachs, who's a respected Silicon Valley leader. He was the former COO of PayPal, at the time that he wrote this stuff, he was CEO and founder of a company called Yammer. Um, and so he used Twitter, a tool which, by the way, didn't exist in 2004, to vent his outrage at Yahoo. So unprompted by us, unsolicited, he says, he tweeted, I'm declaring it, Yammer will never hire another former Yahoo employee who doesn't leave in the next 60 days. Who will join me? Hashtag stop Yahoo. Then he, he offers the carrot as well. The next day, he said, I'm pleased to announce a $25,000 signing bonus for any Yahoo employee who joins Yammer in the next 60 days. A few apparently trickled out. He wanted to increase this. So a few days later, again from David Sachs, Yahoo employees, why are you still there? <laughs> you work for a patent troll. Quit now to send a message and preserve your dignity. Um, Sachs, as an engineer himself, explained the basis of his anger. He said, every software patent is a law prohibiting the writing of code in a given area. The PTO is prohibiting software creation at an alarming rate. Software code is already protected by copyright law. The results of that code should not be patentable. Echoing David Sachs was the highly influential venture capitalist and technology leader Fred Wilson out of Union Square Ventures. 
Fred Wilson, again, unprompted, this is a blog, he wrote, Yahoo has broken ranks and crossed the unspoken line, which is that web companies don't sue each other over their bogus patent portfolios. I don't think there's a unique idea out there in the web space and hasn't been for well over a decade. Pretty much everything useful is based on prior art going back before the commercial web existed. He said, I am not writing this in defense of Facebook. They can and will defend themselves. I am writing this in outrage at Yahoo. I used to care about that company for some reason. No more. They are dead to me. Dead and gone. I hate them now. <laughs> so <laughs> tell us how you really feel. Um, plenty of others, including even Mark Cuban, the outspoken entrepreneur and owner of the Dallas Mavericks, decided to weigh in on this on our side. Um, perhaps most damaging to Yahoo was a blog that was written by somebody named Andy Bayo, who is one of, the for one of Yahoo's former programmers. Bayo, again, unsolicited, wrote a, wrote a long piece titled, it put, published a long piece called A Patent Lie, How Yahoo Weaponized My Work. He wrote, I'm no fan of Facebook. I don't know why people keep saying that, but um, <laughs> he said, I'm no fan of Facebook, but this lawsuit is a deplorable move by Yahoo. It's nothing less than extortion, expertly timed during the SEC mandated quiet period before Facebook's IPO. It's an attack on invention and the hacker ethic. He recalled that during his time at Yahoo, Yahoo lawyers assured us that the patent portfolio was a precautionary measure to defend against patent trolls and others who might try to attack Yahoo. I thought I was giving them a shield, but it turns out I gave them a missile with my name permanently engraved on it. Yahoo's lawsuit against Facebook is an insult to the talented engineers who filed patents at Yahoo with the understanding they wouldn't be used for evil. Betraying that trust won't be forgotten, but I doubt it matters anymore. Nobody I know wants to work for a company like that. So these were strong words from the programmer community. We didn't have to you know, lift a finger as the, we didn't have to go with lawyer, normal lawyer, you know, strong words in the legal department. This is all being done out there by unaffiliated technologists. So these reactions were, were typical. I could go on and it'd be fun for me to go on, but, but I'll stop. Um, uh, suffice to say that public opinion was decidedly on our side in this immediately after Yahoo went ahead with a complaint. One article, one, I think this is the Wall Street Journal, Recode or, or All Things Digital said, Silicon, they, their, headline, their headline was, Silicon Valley has Facebook's back in Yahoo knife fight. And that was pretty much true. Time Magazine actually commented on this saying, when Yahoo filed a patent suit against Facebook this week, it became as popular as Rush Limbaugh at a Planned Parenthood gathering. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Um, so inside Facebook, we were quite pleased to see this furious negative reaction to Yahoo's lawsuit, but we're not surprised, perhaps because we are a young company, you know, only founded in 2004 and only gaining traction in sort of 07, 08. Most of our engineers had this mindset, so we were very familiar with this mindset of engineers. Maybe that's also because we had Mark Zuckerberg, who's extremely young and still, you know, today, and always has such a strong influence of the company, and this is his view as well. But we understood the modern engineer's view of patents, and we, we believed that public opinion would be on our side in this battle. Still, though, we were faced with the question of how to respond. So we had anticipated just this type. We, we, you know, we, in, the legal, in the legal team, under the expert guidance of a guy named Sam O'Rourke, who is our, still there now as deputy GC in charge of IP, we had thought about, over time, you, know, you can't do anything against the non-practicing entities that may come after you, the patent trolls that may come after you. But what you can do is figure out what companies might likely come after you at what stage and try to include in the patent portfolio that you build and acquire patents that are valuable against them. So we had done that. So we're not babes in the woods there. So we, we had done this quietly. Um, so we had things that we could fire back at Yahoo, but it, and we knew that, that Counterclaiming with some patents would raise the cost, uncertainty, and risk against Yahoo, and at minimum raise our negotiating leverage. And again, this was a delicate time. It's the middle of the IPO, uh, the lead up to the IPO. But consider also, Yahoo had just infuriated the entire valley by suing us for patent infringement. And that universal scorn against Yahoo is valuable to us. So if Facebook punched back at Yahoo with our own pa patent counterclaims, as traditional litigation tactics dictated, would the valley similarly turn on us? Would we lose all that goodwill that we had received unsolicited? Would engineers say, we used to be on the Facebook side when you were the victim, but now you're, just, you're coming forward with your own software patents, so you're just as bad as Yahoo, a pox on both your houses. Maybe even Facebook engineers would have that reaction. So I think to, to, a, to a room of lawyers, I, it's, it's, it does seem like an easy call, I think, that of course you're gonna counterclaim. 
but it actually was not easy. It's, you, you, you think, of course, file the counterclaims. Everyone's going to understand you're just defending yourself, but, but maybe not. Maybe you'll lose that, and they'll say, listen, just, just blow each other up. This is bad all around. You both are using bad patents and so on. So it was something we, we it's, it's a strategic and tactical question we really wrestled with during the time before our answer was due. Um, in the end, we decided to file the patent counterclaims against Yahoo, but we did so in a way that was measured and calculated to send a message to the community. First, while we had many patents at our disposal in the portfolio, we asserted only 10 patents back against Yahoo. Why 10? Because Yahoo had, had put 10 in in its complaint against us to begin with. So we thought that would send the message that we were simply responding in kind, not escalating. In the words of John Rambo from First Blood, they drew First Blood, not me. Um, but second, because the public perception of our patent counterclaims is so important, among a lay audience, that is the programmer audience, and an audience hostile to patents, we, we knew that we had to explain and frame our actions. We couldn't simply throw out a complaint and hope that people interpret it properly. So when we made our filing, we issued a statement from me as the general counsel, which is a little unusual. Usually you just do a corporate spokesman who says, we filed a complaint today, we look forward to litigating this. But we did something, it wasn't real complex, but, but we knew it would be as important, if not more important, than the complaint itself. So my statement was this, a uh, statement attributed to me. From the outset, we said we would defend ourselves vigorously against Yahoo's lawsuit. And today, we filed our answer as well as counterclaims against Yahoo for infringing 10 of Facebook's patents. While we are asserting claims of our own, we do so in response to Yahoo's short-sighted decision to attack one of its partners and prioritize litigation over innovation. The tone was more in sorrow than in anger, almost apologetic. Then we waited, unsure of how this would be received, how our counterclaims would be perceived by the tech community. Soon enough, the reaction started rolling in, and our message had been received and understood. It's not that complex a message, but it had been received and understood. The tech leaders, importantly, the software engineers, were still on our side, notwithstanding their hatred for software patents. A couple of examples here. There's a guy named Chris Dixon, who's now a partner of mine at Andreessen Horowitz. I didn't know him at the time, but he's a very influential venture capitalist and technologist, a programmer himself. So he blogged that same day, he looked at our complaint and my statement, and he said, like many in tech, I believe all software patents should be abolished. That said, I think Facebook made the right move by filing a lawsuit against Yahoo's patent attack. As I see it, Facebook had four choices, settle, defend without countersuing, countersue, just plain and simple, or countersue and signal they are averse to patent lawsuits which in turn signals they will drop the lawsuit if Yahoo does. This seems to be what Facebook has done. So Chris Dixon, perceptive man. Um, he, so that's exactly, that's pretty much the menu of the options we had, and, and, he, and he had received the message. And he says, and again, his, you know, my voice is not influential there. His voice is highly influential in that community. And again, this is, we didn't brief him on this. He's just reacting to what we put out there. Countersuing gives Facebook the best chance of fending off Yahoo's lawsuit and therefore not rewarding patent lawsuits. And by signaling they're only doing so in response to Yahoo, Facebook stays on the right side of innovation. And that last phrase is perfect. Um, Paul Graham, the influential, uh, another Valley leader, he's the founder of Y Combinator, um, which is a, an incubator for tech companies out there. He similarly looked at this and wrote, the Valley and the hacker community generally seem to be on Facebook's side. This is following the counterclaims. I'm impressed that Facebook is fighting back instead of settling to make the IPO easier, as companies so often do, and as Yahoo probably expected them to do. Yahoo has clumsily picked a fight with an opponent who is a lot fiercer than they realized. Surveying all of this positive reaction to our counterclaims, TechCrunch, which is one of the leading tech news websites, summarized, Quote, Facebook has executed a masterful response to Yahoo's patent trolling that protects it legally but still makes it look like the victim. So to the room full of Facebook lawyers, that had a nice ring to it. Masterful response, great. Um, but seriously, that was a pivotal moment in the case. We managed to defend ourselves vigorously while retaining all the pro-Facebook goodwill and anti-Yahoo sentiment that had come out after Yahoo's lawsuit. Once we had achieved that, it was only a matter of time until the case resolved favorably to us. I won't go through all the colorful details of how the case played out. That could take months. I've already taken a while on it. Suffice to say that Facebook's IPO went forward in May. The Yahoo patent case ended with a quiet settlement in July. The settlement, no payment whatsoever by Facebook to Yahoo. Full, free cross-license for each company to the full patent portfolio of the other company. And Facebook, as something of a Valley hero, 
for having stood up against software patent abuse and defending innovation. And also, between the filing of our counterclaims and the settlement, Yahoo's CEO and general counsel both resigned. Both had reportedly been the prime movers between, behind the decision to sue Facebook. And Facebook bought a stable of early internet patents from AOL and Microsoft, but not from Yahoo. Uh, shortly after the case was settled, the news website Business Insider put a capstone on the whole episode. The article stated, just so we're clear, Facebook totally demolished Yahoo in the patent fight that just ended. <laughs> Yahoo's plan, it seemed, was to quickly extract cash from Facebook, which was about to go through an IPO and would throw money at any problems to make them go away. This plan did not work. Instead of paying Yahoo to go away, Facebook did what it always does in legal battles. It dug a trench, filled it with lawyers, and prepared for war. Since the company was founded, Facebook lawyers have always been exceptionally aggressive. They bring nukes to a knife fight. I think that last quote is still on the wall in the Facebook legal department and in the recruiting brochures for the Facebook legal team. Um, but seriously, much as we would like to claim the victory is due to good lawyering on the Facebook side, both internally and with Wilmer Hale, which is our outside firm, and Cooley, which is another outside firm we used on that, um, I think the lion's share of the credit, and, and in Yahoo's perspective, the blame, has to go to the sea change in Silicon Valley attitudes toward patents with Yahoo had simply failed to appreciate. Um, so the two key takeaways from this Yahoo case study that I see are, one, it's a, I think, a huge, particularly vivid illustration of just how skeptical, even, even hostile, today's engineers are towards software patents. I mean, some of the vitriol you heard in there, and you know, leave the company, it's a patent troll, I used to respect the company, all that, it's, that's how people feel. And number two, how recently and rapidly that view has arisen. Remember, as recently as 2004, only eight years prior, no one blinked when Yahoo pursued a patent lawsuit against Google. This is what you do. This makes sense. If they're infringing your patents, go make them pay for it. But eight years later, the landscape had changed so fundamentally among engineers in the Valley that Yahoo instantly became a pariah for pursuing the same strategy, and it ended in disaster. Uh, moving on now to copyright and trademark. Copyright. Recall that in some of what we were going through there, David Sachs, the Yammer CEO, when he was blasting software patents, he said, we don't need patent because copyright, because software code is already copyrighted, already protected by copyright law. So you might think that Silicon Valley engineers are pro-copyright if they're anti-patent. Uh, not so, really. The case against copyright from a Silicon Valley perspective is that traditional media companies are too aggressive in enforcing their copyrights um, too, just too aggressive overall in enforcing their copyrights, particularly against web users and against web companies like Facebook and Google. In this view, copyright is an antiquated tool used by media giants, music and film primarily, to hinder innovation and competition from companies that are attempting to unseat the, attempting to unseat the media giants from the internet space. Um, now, a little background on this. Uh, DMCA, of course, is the safe harbor that protects you know, companies like Facebook and Google that host user-generated content, protects us against claims of copyright infringement as, with this notice and takedown regime. As, if we receive a notice from a company that a copyright is being infringed, as long as we react quickly enough and don't encourage this sort of abuse on the site, then we are not liable. Only the user is liable. So DMCA DMCA immunity is quite important to us, and that's a balance that's struck in the in the copyright laws. Um, and the view, though, the view of web companies is that the media companies too often push up and try to try to defeat the purpose of DMCA and file DMCA notice and take, DMCA takedown notices far too quickly, far too frequently harassing users, making it hard on web companies, and just creating a huge cost of business that deters people from sharing information on the web. That's essentially the view. And the case study here is SOPA, PIPA. Um, I'll tell you what those mean. This was in late 2011, early 2012. This is an episode that still resonates strongly in Silicon Valley, Hollywood, and Washington, DC. So here, Hollywood, I'll use that term for the media industry, Hollywood convinced Washington that new rules were needed to combat copyright infringement. That DMCA was not effective enough, or DMCA gave too much of a safe harbor to uh, web companies like ourselves, that, that the, the, the notice and takedown regime was a good system, but it just wasn't being used frequently enough, and that people were getting away with too much infringement. This is the view of media companies. The web view, by the way, is, you know, most, 
most of this stuff we think is not infringing, it falls into fair use, and by the way, most of this is very good for you selling your movie, generating interest in your movie, generating interest in your book, generating interest in your music. And if you look at how popular online music is today, we say that wouldn't have happened if you had been too aggressive in, in combating copyright infringement and, and fair use, in our view. But anyway, in 2011, uh, Hollywood persuaded Congress that we needed new rules and so these two laws were proposed, the Stop, o Stop Online Piracy Act, SOPA, and the Protect IP Act, PIPA. They came through together. These got considerable traction in Washington and were really on the verge of being enacted in, or at least being passed in Congress late in 20, 2011 when web companies and technologists finally woke up and said, wow, this is, this is, exact, this is a real threat to DMCA. This is a real threat to, the in, to innovation on the web. So all of a sudden, web companies, and, but primarily technologists and innovators and, and programmers rebelled. Even at the end of the day, MC Hammer, yes, the 1980, early 1990s rapper, got into the fray on the side of web companies. Um, so he was out there at some, you know, pounding the table at some events. The anti-SOPA and PIPA argument was that under the guise of combating web, web piracy, the big media companies were unduly constraining fair use doctrine engaging in censorship of expression on the web and hindering innovation and competition. Move On, for example, wrote, got into, they got into, involved in this. They said, Congress is playing fast and loose with internet censorship legislation that would have people like Justin Bieber thrown in jail for uploading a video to YouTube. I don't know, some people may not have found that a bad thing. Um, <laughs> but the internet censorship legislation could severely restrict free speech and put a stranglehold on one of the most innovative job creating industries of our time. This drew users to the fight. Um, Wikipedia and Reddit, two very prominent tech, uh, you know, internet sites, among other sites, shut down for a day to protest SOPA and PIPA. Google did not shut down, but ran a black banner over the Google logo at the top to protest this. So faced with this intense opposition, Congress blinked. SOPA and PIPA were shelved in early 2012. This would have been inconceivable a few years earlier. Clearly, that legislation would have passed through with Hollywood's comparative power in Washington. And it was not a tribute to the companies. It was really a user revolt. A, you know, users were the ones who were concerned. The companies, including Facebook, we were a little behind, behind the eight ball on this, but users got this rolling and stopped SOPA and PIPA. But the fundamental argument was that this would risk changing copyright law in a way that made it easier to invoke copyright to constrain innovation on the web. Um, and that was an unexpectedly powerful argument and it carried the day. Um, one other point I'd note on, on copyright, we see this today in the debate over the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the trade deal that President Obama negotiated. Silicon Valley, as a general matter, is emphatically pro-trade. Um, it's, you know, we're on the, we're on the Pacific Rim, um, it, we, we need, we need we, free flow of goods, information, data, people, so on, we love free trade out there. But on TPP, the, the view of Silicon Valley currently is more mixed, and that surprised me, honestly. And it, it, the, the view relates to copyright. That's why, that's why people are, are skeptical about TPP out there. Um, and they're the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, which is one of the leading groups summarizing kind of the Valley zeitgeist, um, has come out strongly against TPP because of copyright. And here's what the EFF argues. EFF says TPP will require countries to adopt heightened copyright protection that advances the agenda of the US entertainment industry, but omits the flexibility and exceptions that protect internet users and technology innovators. And they continue, the IP chapter of TPP in particular would have extensive negative ramifications for users' freedom of expression, right to privacy and due process, as well as hindering people's ability to innovate. So that's, that's the view, that's the prevailing view, I think, that you see of copyright today. It's a risky thing in the view of Silicon Valley, right or wrong. This is the view of, of technology leaders in Silicon Valley today. Copyright is not, a, it's not helping innovation, it's hindering innovation on the web. And we have to hold the line and make sure DMCA is still operative and that the safe harbor keeps working for us. Uh, trademark now. Even friendly old trademark law is subject to its, to its share of criticism in Silicon Valley, and this was surprising to me. So traditional doctrine requires, of course, aggressive vigilance against, against trademark infringement. Um, that's pretty uncontroversial as sort of trade, day one trademark law, probably. Um, the case study here is our own trademark monitoring and enforcement 
efforts at Facebook. So to be clear, Facebook's not always the good guy in my stories. Um, we started off taking a fairly traditional and aggressive posture at Facebook against what we perceive as trademark in trademark enforcement against what we saw as trademark infringement. Not only would we, of course, take action against anybody using the term Facebook or Mark or using it in a social networking context, but we actually went further than that and, and used, we challenged sites that use the prefix, social networking sites, not just any site, but social networking sites that use the prefix face or the suffix book in their names. We challenged those on trademark grounds. And, when, and we were successful in that. And when Facebook, generally in the courts, we were successful in that. When Facebook was still a fledgling startup company, say until 09 or 010, this approach made sense. But over time, as Facebook became more established and more powerful, our trademark enforcement efforts, which to a lawyer seemed routine, became controversial. The sense was that the big bully Facebook was unnecessarily harassing innovative websites. Sure, they may have been infringing as a matter of customary trademark, man, trademark law, but come on, man. If, is Facebook really threatened by a nascent social network site that wants to use book or face in the title? Who seriously is going to be confused? Shouldn't we be flattered by the use of our name? Wasn't this a sign the company had arrived? And if we're aggressive in going after these sites, aren't we crushing the dreams of some young innovator like Zuckerberg a few years prior? Why are we doing this? Some of our own employees had these questions, and plenty of people outside the company in the tech community in Silicon Valley raised these questions. You guys are being bullies. And you can't, as a lawyer, you can't simply ignore those questions and cite traditional trademark law. So suffice to say, without getting into specific cases on this, um, in case some are still pending there, but our trademark enforcement standards modified as we went along through the years. We had to adapt and balance protection of the company in, in cases where we really needed to protect the mark, but with the realities of contemporary Silicon Valley attitudes and perceptions about trademark and about IP law out there. So second trend now, the trend that I mentioned at the outset, the emerging sense of the fundamental free market premise of traditional IP law may be out of date and out of touch with the Valley. So there's a growing sense among some engineers, many engineers, that innovation is best promoted not by the promise of exclusive rights and reaping the pro benefits of one's invention, but rather by sharing, including free sharing and collaboration. This is the open source movement that I mentioned earlier you may have heard about, you may have read about, some of you may be participants in. And the prime case study here is Facebook's open compute project which is very interesting from a lawyer's perspective. The Open Compute Project relates to the design of data centers and servers. Um, at the risk of going over stuff that's obvious for some in the room, servers are essentially computers that are dedicated to storing and serving up data, quick, store, storing data and serving up data quickly on demand when it's requested. And a data center is essentially a huge building or even a virtual space, uh, but that connects hundreds or thousands of servers connected together and working together to store a lot of data and to process data requests. In short, data centers and the servers in the centers are the back end that the user never sees but that makes a website work and, and makes your Google search results pop up, makes your Waze directions pop up, makes your Facebook photos uh, show when you want them to show into which users and which not users. So for a consumer internet company like Facebook which stores and serves data for I think now it's something like 1.4, 1.5 billion monthly active users worldwide, uh, monthly active users worldwide. The cost of buying servers, computers, and building and running data centers is without question, far and away, the number one cost that the company incurs in, run, in conducting its business. So whenever Facebook releases quarterly earnings, which it will do in a couple weeks for Q1, the expense number, and specifically the, the, the infrastructure number, data center and server cost, is closely scrutinized by Wall Street. And you'll see when Facebook stock goes down, it's generally because the CFO has given guidance that, wow, we're, expen we're gonna heavily invest in a new data center this time. So they say, well, it's, that's very expensive, and are they be gonna be able to sustain these costs? There's a lot of question about this before Facebook went public. How can you possibly, you know, for a free product that's supported by ads, how can you possibly sustain these enormous costs? So presumably, if you're in-house programmers and data scientists could design servers and data centers that operated much more efficiently than the industry standard, that would be an important competitive advantage, you would think, in a highly competitive sector of internet, internet companies. That's an advantage you'd want to keep yourself, exploit it to build market share, improve earnings, build a moat around your company, keep your competitors in the rearview mirror. 
Um, that would be traditional business thinking and traditional lawyer thinking. Um, that exclusive rights paradigm of incentives. That would give you the incentive and give your engineers the incentive in the first place to, to develop these great, these great uh, efficiencies. But that's not what happened at Facebook with Open Compute. So the story of Open Compute, we go back to 2009 for this, and this is from, I remember this going on, and this is as the, as the Open Compute website now talks about it. This is quoting from the site. In 2009, Facebook was growing exponentially offering new services and giving millions of people a platform to share photos and videos. Looking ahead, the company realized that it had to rethink its infrastructure to accommodate the huge influx of new people and data and also control costs and energy consumption. That's when Facebook started a project to design the world's most energy efficient data center, one that could handle, handle unprecedented scale at the lowest possible cost. A small team of engineers spent the next two years, 2009 to 2011, designing and building one from the ground up. Software, servers, racks, power supplies, cooling. It, the, the result was a system that is 38% more efficient as of 2011, 38% more efficient to build, and 24% less expensive to run than the company's previous facilities. And it has led, led since 2011 to even greater innovation and cost savings. So those are enormous savings, 38% on the, on the build and 24% on running it. In traditional business thinking, you'd patent those and take those to the bank. But instead, Facebook shared them publicly, shared these designs publicly for free. Again, from the Open Compute website, in 2011, Facebook shared its designs with the public and launched the Open Compute project. The project hoped to create a movement in the hardware space that would bring about the same kind of creativity and collaboration that we see in open source software. And that's exactly what's happening. That's the that's the site talking about this. So why in the world would Facebook do this? And one point that I'd emphasize here, this is not Facebook today that, that did open compute. Facebook today, you might say, well, it's a $300 billion market cap company. It's a leading company. They can afford to be magnanimous and be green. They're trying to you know, connect, the, connect the world and build goodwill. They can afford to give things away. But no, this is not 2016. This was 2011. Facebook was still a private company more than a year away from going public. There are plenty of skeptics who predicted the company would never be successful, as I say, and primarily because of the cost problem. Presumably, Facebook needed every advantage it could get, especially homegrown, internally developed cost advantages. So why do this? Why give the technology away to a traditional business mind that seems totally nuts? But it's really, it really is a testament to the mindset difference about open source these days. Um, and here it is, you can't say it better than it said on the Open Compute website, quote, we believe that openly sharing ideas, specifications, and other intellectual property is the key to maximizing innovation and reducing complexity in tech components, unquote. So this perspective that innovation is best achieved through, quote, openly sharing ideas, often for free, is gaining traction in Silicon Valley. Facebook's head of engineering Jonathan Heiliger, in announcing Open Compute in 2011, said, we want to share the innovations in our data center for the entire industry to use and improve upon. Everyone has full access to these specifications, for free, by the way, which are available at opencompute.org. So note that as well. You don't have to fill out a form or come into Facebook and seek permission. You can just go to Open Compute. Door. You can do it now on your phone um, and find the, the, the innovations there and, and find the specs. Here's Heiliger continuing. We want you to tell us where we didn't get it right and suggest how we could improve. And opening the technology means the community will make advances that we wouldn't have discovered if we had kept this secret. We invite you to join us in this mission to collectively develop the most efficient computing infrastructure possible. One of the quick but prominent example of the open source, open sharing movement is one that many of you in the audience may be familiar with and may have on you right now. This is the Android phone. So if you have an Android phone, you know what this is. But Apple, you know, I think in the US in particular, we tend to think of Apple as the dominant, uh, the dominant smartphone um, and tablet producer. Uh, and whereas Apple, the creator of the iPhone, is famously secretive about its designs. They're not, they're not an open sourcing company. But Google, the which is the developer of Android, has taken the opposite tack in the smartphone wars. So Google bought Android in 2005 and released the Android operating system for phones and tablets in 07. But rather than keeping it proprietary and developing Google-only phones, Google open sources Android, gives it away for free. 
under a license, but it's free, it's a free license. The strategy here is to get Google's operating system out and installed on as many phones in the world as possible. And indeed, although in the United States you may think of iPhone as the market leader, that's actually not the case, even in the US and certainly worldwide. Android phones are actually the smartphone market share leader virtually everywhere other than Japan and Australia, often by wide margins. So in the US, Android has 59% market share of smartphones. Apple, surprisingly, only 39%. China, the stats are 71% Android, 28% Apple. And in a company like Spain, pretty typical of Europe, 86% Android OS, 12% Apple. So in Google's case, I think that's an understandable business strategy. Again, they're hoping to monetize. They're trying to get Android installed worldwide on so many smartphones, be the dominant OS for smartphones worldwide, and then somehow monetize the operating system, such as through having all those Android users worldwide using Google products, or now Alphabet products, on their phones and viewing paid advertisements on Google. So there maybe there's a, little, you know, there's a, there's a method to this giveaway. Uh, but in addition, the sense among many Silicon Valley tech leaders and, and programmers I talk to, I, I still use an iPhone, uh, but among most technologists, they, I find they use Android, Android OS phones. And they find that they say it's, it's hands down superior. Hands down the technology on the, on the Android is superior. And they attribute that to the open source nature of Android. They say, look, Apple's great. Apple's a brilliant company. They do fantastic things, and, and they, they're a real market leader. But it's one company with a bunch of great engineers as opposed to worldwide open source. Any engineer can just go up and look this up and contribute code and use code for new things. And um, So the benefit, of, again, is this Heiliger point, Jonathan Heiliger from Facebook, talking about you know, if you have the eyes of smart programmers from around the world taking a look at this, you're going to end up with better products, better innovations than you will if you just keep this closed. Um, my last point on the rise of open source thinking is when you view this in combination with the antipathy of today's engineers toward patents, this is my pitch for the lawyers, this makes it quite challenging and interesting for in-house lawyers at tech companies. Um, because This is because for almost every company, even if you're absolutely dedicated to participating in open source, it's still important to develop a stable of patents, at minimum to deter and respond to attacks like Yahoo's lawsuit. But today's engineers tend to run away from in-house patent lawyers. It's really, it, it's, it's oil and water. The cultures are absolutely different. Um, so it, it's, and, and they don't want to spend time with patent lawyers, and they also want to go and open source everything. Um, so it takes special skills, I think not just legal skills, but more to the point, people skills and EQ for an in-house IP lawyer at a Silicon Valley tech company today to strike that right balance and to, to, to build the goodwill and relationships with the programmers so that they will come forward with potentially patentable inve inventions. And at Facebook, I think we did, we learned, we had to learn a ton along the way. Um, you're not going to wear a tie into, the, into a meeting like that, or you know, certainly not a blazer. Um, but we had to learn along the way, and, and I think we did a decent job of this, but it really was something we then looked for in recruiting IP lawyers to the comp company. I wouldn't spend time, you know, you, it wouldn't let me near, an IP, near, near, a, near, a, you know, near a programmer, but our IP team, under the guy Sam O'Rourke I mentioned earlier, the deputy GC, we built a team that was very heavy on CS majors, people who had, as undergrads you know, had, had developed CS skills, you know, who programmed themselves in their free time, that was a big thing we would look for, who dressed like programmers rather than like lawyers, um, t-shirts and flip-flops, that's much better. And again, who could understand, we actually brought in some, some people who are some of the pioneering young lawyers, this is seven, you know, I don't know, seven, six years ago, some of the pioneering young lawyers who had discovered open source themselves as programmers and then decided, wow, I want to do this in law. I want to figure out the law around open source. We would look for people like that. I think we're the first company to hire some actual in-house open source lawyers. There just weren't that many. So we brought some in, and they did a great job of striking this balance and building credibility so that they could engage with engineers and get some things to patent, but also open source and build that credibility and, and, and not throw up when somebody came in and proposed open source, proposed open compute, which seemed crazy. So um, it takes a lot of time and effort to get this balance right. And if any of you in the audience, any of the law students here are CS grad, please let me know. And, and I think that combination of computer science or willingness to learn co computer programming plus law is a very valuable, it's a highly valuable combination in Silicon Valley today. So 
thank you for enduring such a lengthy discussion of IP law. I hope you enjoyed some of the war stories, as we'll call them case studies, it sounds more official. Um, seriously, I hope, I, I hope this conveyed a sense of the interesting challenges faced by in-house IP lawyers in Silicon Valley today as they try to work with traditional IP law that we all respect and, and, and learned and, and believe in, um, but trying to square that with a rapidly moving trends and views in a highly innovative sector of the economy. Uh, with that, again, thanks for having me today. I've really enjoyed it, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have. So I suppose it would be small to issue a rebuttal to the introductory comments. Um, <laughs> permit me simply to say that I stood in Greg Conway's living room in Green Bay in September of 2003, <laughs> and in the presence of Tom Olenicek, I disclosed that I was a Minnesota Vikings fan. Um, I did quickly turn it to my advantage by pointing out that given that I had married a Bears fan, I'm digging myself deeper here, I know. <laughs> it was okay because the kids were quite plainly Packers fans, and it was evidence that once I have a loyalty, I don't let go of it. Um, <laughs> I, I did not know where you were going with that introduction, but uh, <laughs> next At time... At least it came back to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, so um, let's take uh, two questions, um, and then we're going to have a reception uh, in the Zilber Forum, and uh, as you have been able to tell with Ted, he is a highly engaging fellow and will be pleased to answer your questions out there. Um, but let's just get uh, a couple questions on the record, as it were, here, and then we'll uh, go outside. Yes, can you stand up um, uh, and ask your question, uh, please, if Ryan uh, can get you a microphone, and we'll be finished here in about four or five minutes. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my Hello. name is Ashanti, and I wanted to ask, what advice would you give intellectual property attorneys who are working in this area now where the climate is so anti-intellectual property, seeing as how you, you recognize that there's the need to balance doing what you, know, you should as an attorney and following the law and dealing with public opinion over it? Um, I... I think, I don't know that I have a special, any special insight on that. I've, I've done that and got beaten down. I think part of it is if you're at, if you're at, a, if you're at an engineer-dominated company, understand you will lose the battle when it goes finally up to the top. You know, so if, you, if you're debating with the head of engineering about whether, whether we should open source or patent something, if he's really dug in, you know, you know yes, you're... you're equal and officially equal, but it's an engineering company, so it's gonna get open sourced. Um, have a sense of humor about it. Uh, but actually, but, but over time, lay out, I think it's, you know, hopefully there's a repeat engagement that you're working in, and you can say, listen, we, we do need to patent some things, and we do, do need to, on the copyright front, just talk about that. The, the media companies do have some legitimate instances where, where there's actually some infringing content on the site, so let's set up a system to respond to DMCA notices that is, you know, that, that, yeah, our users may not love it, but we've got to abide by the law, and we can't afford to get tagged with liability ourselves. So we do need to do that. explain the purpose of the laws and, and this, but also I think be, be willing to balance some, in the open source and patenting, some open source inventions and some things you'll patent. Be prepared to balance that, but also explain the need for balance and the ultimate goals of the law, even to, even to engineers who don't have a legal background. They'll get it, and they'll, I think, grudgingly acknowledge that over time, and, and um, uh, you can't open source everything. I think if you just approach it with that and, and make trade-offs here and there, just try to make them, you know, the, 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 you know, try not to give away the crown jewels of the company open sourced, such as, for example, big data center efficiencies. You'd never want to give that away. But, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, and then we are going to go to the Zilber Forum. Any other questions here? Uh, yes. Um, can you press the button in front of you, the rim, and hold it down, simply so we can hear it. <laughs> Go ahead and just... Um, I'm really intrigued by your open source thinking concept. Have you, I work in a financial technology, business Great. to business, and have you seen any solutions with this open source thinking with... <laughs> Uh, working with your business clients, trying to come up with the best of breed thinking because the, the issues are so complex, the speed by which you have to resolve them. 
uh, it's just going faster and faster in this open source thinking, bringing the clients and, you know. On non-technological issues on, or on technology issues? On technology issues. So on technology issues, yes, we've seen that. In fact, I should have mentioned this, that, that one of the very interesting things about open compute was Facebook, Facebook threw open these, these data center designs and, uh, and then invited people to partner with Facebook and share and collaborate, not just informally, but formally. So invited other companies to come in and do this. And one of the first companies to join in was Goldman Sachs. Interesting. Because Goldman Sachs processes probably not more data than Facebook, but, but close. And they've got to keep it not just efficient, but ultra secure. So they, they've brought in more of a security focus on that because you know, their needs for security are even higher than Facebook's needs for security. So Goldman jumped in early. And I believe now you know, the thing's expanded. So I, the, the, I couldn't tell you the full roster now. But there are other financial, both financial institutions and then also what I think of as fintech, financial tech institutions, some of the startups that are working in the space. Most fintech, most fintech startups, I'd say, are I mean, they're like the 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 developers behind the, behind those are absolutely believers in open source, skeptics of patents. They're traditional software engineers at this point. So let me say uh, three things. Uh, one, as I have mentioned, we will have a reception in the Zilber Forum, and Ted will be pleased to tell you more things, um, <laughs> whether about me, perhaps, uh, or of considerably greater interest, his experiences in either Washington, D.C. or Silicon Valley. The second is to put in a plug for two events that we have here tomorrow. One is an On the Issues with Mike Ushay, and the guest will be Judge Brett Kavanaugh of the D.C. Circuit, whom Ted has mentioned, and Ted himself, and they will be particularly discussing with Mike their experiences as staff secretary in Judge Kavanaugh's case and deputy staff secretary in Ted's case to President George W. Bush in the White House. So that should be a very interesting and engaging discussion. The other event is our Jenkins Honors Moot Court Finals. If you want to come out and support our students, that too will be in this room. We will reveal what's behind the uh, panels, which is to say the appellate bench and in addition to Judge Kavanaugh, whom I've mentioned, Judge Diane Sykes of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, who is here now, will be back for that, along with Judge Gary Feinerman of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. So it's a big event in the life of the law school, the Jenkins Honors Moot Court Finals, and that is uh, that the doors close at 5.45 p.m. tomorrow. The On the Issues is at 12.15 p.m. And third, I simply want to say a very warm and well-deserved thank you to Ted Olliott for a highly engaging Nice lecture. Um, thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs>